the Arrhenius equation, activation energy, and catalysts. Okay, in our final section of chemical kinetics, we're going to talk about reaction rates and how they relate to temperature. And we've already discussed that the rate of a reaction generally goes up with increasing temperature. And we also discussed the fact that the rate constant K is temperature dependent. And so we just mentioned that in the very first presentation on chemical kinetics. But the big question is why is the rate constant temperature dependent? And basically, the overall reaction rate depends on how frequently molecules collide. And so we call this the frequency of collisions. The second factor is the fraction of those collisions that have enough energy for the molecules to react. So do those molecules collide with enough energy to react? And finally, molecules need to be in the correct orientation in order to react. And we call that the steric factor. So there's three big factors involved in the overall reaction rate. How often molecules collide, the fraction of those collisions with enough energy to react, and finally the orientation, whether they are properly oriented in order to react. Now, molecules will only react if they collide with each other in the correct orientation. So this factor right there cuts down the potential reaction rate a lot from where it could be, just based on the number of collisions. Now, increasing the temperature increases the energy and frequency of molecular collisions. So if there's an overall larger number of collisions, even if only a small fraction of those have the correct orientation to react, it's still going to be more than there would be at a lower temperature where molecules had less kinetic energy and less energy and frequency of collisions. Now, the Arrhenius equation relates the rate constant, K, to all of these factors. So here is the Arrhenius equation. So this is the rate constant K. This is the same rate constant we've been seeing in our rate laws. And this term right here is called the pre-exponential factor. And it represents the overall likelihood that collisions with the proper orientation occur. This term right here is called the exponential term. So this is e to the negative e sub a, which is the activation energy, divided by r times t. So this is a power. Now r is the gas constant, but this is the energy r. So in our case, we are going to use 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. t is the temperature in Kelvin. So it has to be in Kelvin. We can't have negative numbers in this exponential term. Now, activation energy is the last thing that we will discuss in this presentation. We'll discuss what that is and how it can be modified. So what does the Arrhenius equation have to do with the rate law? All right, so on the previous slide, we saw that the rate constant K, which is the same rate constant we've been talking about, is equal to this quantity, this pre-exponential factor that represents the likelihood that collisions will be productive and react, and then this exponential term. Now, the rate law for this general elementary reaction, we could write as rate equals rate constant times concentration of D times concentration of B. Both of those to the first power because we have a coefficient of 1. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take this term and then plug it in to this rate law so that you can get an idea about what the Arrhenius equation has to do with the rate of reaction. So this whole term basically represents whether molecules have the proper orientation, whether they have enough energy to react. And then, of course, here's our concentration of reactant, and we've also discussed that reaction rates depend on the concentration of reactants. Now the macroscopic reaction rate, so that's the reaction rate that we measure, it's determined by this frequency of collisions having enough energy to overcome the activation energy barrier. And we also have to subtract those that don't have the correct orientation to react. So even if they have enough energy to get over the activation energy barrier, they may not have the correct orientation. 
Now, molecules need to have enough kinetic energy to overcome bonding and repulsion of the reactants. And this minimum amount of energy is called the activation energy. At any temperature, only a small percentage of collisions are going to have enough energy to react. But at low temperature, there's a smaller fraction of molecules with enough energy to react. At higher temperature, there's a larger fraction. And so here is a plot showing the fraction of molecules with a certain energy. And then here's the energy, and these are distributions. So this is a distribution showing the fraction of molecules with each energy. So looking at the low temperature curve first, if we say this is the activation energy, then only this area underneath the curve, that's the only fraction of molecules that has enough energy to actually overcome that activation energy. If we increase the temperature, then the overall average energy of the molecules in this system, it shifts to higher energy. So at higher temperatures, more molecules, you can see this area under the curve here is larger, and that represents the fact that more molecules have enough energy to react. A larger fraction have enough energy to overcome the activation energy at higher temperatures. Okay, so we can find this activation energy by graphing. And so let's take the natural log of both sides of the Arrhenius equation. And when we do that, then we get a linear equation. So this is the natural log of the rate constant at a given temperature. This is the y-intercept, the natural log of the pre-exponential factor a. And the slope is negative ea over r. And we're going to plot versus 1 over t. What we would do is run the reaction at different temperatures, measure the rate constant at those different temperatures, and then plot versus 1 over t in order to get this slope, which is negative activation energy divided by r. So let's see what that looks like. OK, so this is the, uh, a typical plot. So here we have the natural log of a rate constant, and these are at different temperatures. So I'm, I didn't show individual measurements, but let's say that there are four of them, and they're linear. And the slope of this line, once we plot those rate constants versus 1 over temperature, then it will be the negative of the activation energy divided by R. Reactions with a larger activation energy actually show a higher sensitivity of this rate constant to the temperature. So here's an example slope. So this is this negative EA over R. This slope is less steep than the slope for the reaction with a large activation energy. So changing the temperature affects the reaction with a small activation energy less than it affects a reaction with a large activation energy. So the rate constant is more sensitive to temperature if the reaction has a larger activation energy. Now another useful form of this equation relates rate constants at two temperatures. So this is the natural log of the rate constant at temperature 2 divided by the rate constant at temperature 1. And that is equal to the negative of the activation energy divided by R, and then this term involving 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. All right, so now let's take a look at how the energy changes as a reaction progresses. And so let's look at this exothermic diagram first. This is an exothermic reaction. Now, on the x-axis, we have something called the reaction coordinate. You can also just think of that as the progress of the reaction. So as you can see, we're starting off with reactants, and then we are ending up at products. 
Now, this is an exothermic reaction, which means that the reactants are at higher energy than the products. So energy is released during the course of this reaction. And here's that change in energy between the reactants and the products. So when we're at all reactants, so the progress of reaction has hardly started, then the reactants are at this energy. Now, as the reaction progresses, they have to get over this energy hump. And that energy hump is called the activation energy. And the activation energy is the difference in energy between the reactants and the highest point on the diagram, which we call the transition state or the activated complex. So reactants start off here and they have to reach this transition state or this activated complex. And once they do, then they slide downhill in energy and become products. And so at this point, of course, the reaction progress is nearly complete. So the activation energy for an exothermic reaction is the difference in energy between the reactants and the transition state energy. Now for exothermic reactions, it's just a little bit different, very similar in idea, but there are a few differences. One, we are obviously are still starting with reactants. Now this time though, the reactants are lower in energy than the products. So the reactants have to get over a much larger activation energy hump in order to reach products in an endothermic reaction. So in this case, reactants are lower in energy than products, and so we have a positive change in energy change in potential energy or positive delta H. But the big take home here is that the activation energy is a much larger amount of energy for an endothermic reaction than it is for an exothermic reaction. We have talked about the fact that you can increase the rate constant by raising the temperature. But the other thing that you can do is use a catalyst to lower that activation energy. And basically, catalysts change the reaction mechanism in such a way in that they decrease the activation energy. So they decrease that activation energy hump. So here's another diagram. Now again, this is energy versus reaction coordinate or reaction progress. We have an exothermic reaction here, okay? And the original uncatalyzed reaction has the transition state here at higher energy, but notice what happens when we add a catalyst. So basically we've shaved off that hump, and now the activation energy hump is much smaller. So the addition of a catalyst changes the activation energy by this much. So the uncatalyzed reaction has a higher activation energy than the catalyzed reaction. The energy of the products and the reactants remains the same. So the big difference here is that the activation energy is lowered. And that happens by changing the reaction mechanism to a mechanism that has a lower activation energy. Once you lower the activation energy, then you increase the number of molecules with that required amount of energy because you've lowered the requirement. Here's another way to look at it. So this goes back to our fraction of molecules with a particular energy. And here is that energy. And again, we have a distribution here. So in a non-catalyzed reaction, then we have this part of the curve, this area under the curve, this fraction of molecules have enough energy to react. If we add a catalyst, then we've lowered the requirement to a lower collisional energy. So this is a much larger fraction of molecules with enough energy to react. Important things to remember about catalysts. They don't change the thermodynamics of the reaction. So they don't change the position of equilibrium, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. They are not used up or produced in a reaction. So they participate in the reaction, but they are not a reactant or a product. They're not used up. They're not produced. They can be used in less than stoichiometric quantities. So that means you can use a very small amount. 
And they can also be either a homogeneous catalyst, which means the catalyst is of the same phase as the reactants and products, or they can be a heterogeneous catalyst. So that means that they can have an alternate phase, such as a solid metal surface. All right, and I will post example problems separately, so watch for those.